My name is Marcel Lichter, French first name, German surname, happen to be Dutch. Uh, been living in the UK for 15 years and basically my background is hotel and catering management. Working now in IT. <laughs> so that should um, sort of set the tone for an interesting afternoon. So I'll start with a quick introduction of RWE. Uh, over here it's not a very well known brand. Um, what RWE does and then I'll go into what RWE supply and trading does. A um, little bit of a dry introduction, but it actually helps you to understand part of the journey that we were um, on whilst implementing App Dynamics. So, RWE is one of Europe's top five integrated energy companies. Um, it's a very big brand in Germany, as I said. In the UK, it's better known as NPower. We um, are not doing too bad, uh, like most other energy companies. It's, um, it's a challenging market out there at the moment. Uh, these figures are from 2015. Just to sort of reference back a little bit, 210 terawatt hours of energy produced. Um, a normal 100 watt light bulb produces about 0 0.8 watts kilowatt hours. So we're talking about 260 billion light bulbs powered in a year. RWE owns a large amount of the infrastructure. Um, we basically own the power plants, we own the railways, we own the railway trucks, we've got normal trucks, we own the mines, a lot of mines in, uh, throughout Europe, um, and also gas production. So, called the upstream market, we have the power generation, where we um, do our bit for sort of trying to keep energy clean, of course. Uh, wind power is coal-fired, gas-fired, Nuclear, not as much. Uh, Germany no longer has nuclear power. Um, within that, we sit in the middle. Uh, RDB supply and trading. We actually do the trading and sort of generation of the uh, midstream market. I'll go into that in a little bit more detail later on. Um, electricity and gas networks. So we do both electricity and gas in certain countries within uh, Europe, not everywhere. And then, of course, we have our normal B2C element as well within that segment. So NPower, as I mentioned, in the UK, supplies houses, households, so does LW, RW in Germany, and other upcodes within, uh, within Europe. Our West is basically set up in three main structures, supply and trading, commercial asset optimization, CAO for short. Um, I'll probably re reference back to that later on, where we basically keep an eye on how we generate the power, how much power we generate, and how much we should or should not be generating. Then the trading element, which is the sort of interesting part where we basically generate, where we keep an eye on the markets to actually see what the current demand is um, and buy and sell energy. Origination is gas supply. This is around uh, LNG, so the liquid, a liquefied uh, natural gas. Um, you probably have seen a few pictures of these very very, very large tankers uh, out on the ocean. We have a few of those floating around and basically direct them wherever there's immediate need for um, gas supply. Our IT environment, we're only a small company, RDB Supply and Trading. Uh, we're about 2,000 people in total. Um, RDB as a whole has about 45,000 people now, I think. So we're quite small. IT department in itself is about 350 people. Our IT environment is 1,300 servers, 150 server-based apps that we know of, uh, real-time connections back into the power plants, as I said, to basically uh, turn up, turn down what is required. We have only four hours of downtime available every single week on a Sunday. We trade every other minute of the day across the world. So we have trading floors in New York, Singapore, uh, London. Um, in Australia, we have a little outfit. Our head office is in Essen in Germany, near Dusseldorf. And we have a small trading floor in Swindon as well. Didn't want to mention that because it's not a great place to go. But. So four hours of downtime every single week. So you can sort of guess that trying to coordinate downtime, patching maintenance windows is very, very difficult to do. And we only had infrastructure monitoring. 
So up, down, CPU, memory, that sort of thing, and not really much else. I'll give you a quick example of one of the tier one applications. Um, we have the power plants generating the power, as they do. The output is basically collected back into our data center um, real time to know exactly what's going on and how much energy is being produced. We do some clever stuff in the background with that and then actually see where there's a need for it in the market. Yeah? This is sold across Europe. So we have power that could be generated in France, selling it in Poland. Power that could be generated in Oslo, going back into the other direction down to France or wherever. It's across Europe, it goes across the borders. Buying power, trading power is also happening on the international markets, which basically means we hand it from left to right where possible. Yeah. It also goes the other way. So if we see a gap or a need in the market, and we can actually provide or turn up the power stations quick enough, we actually will say, hey, turn that up 5% because I've got a gap in the Polish market that I can produce very, very cheaply, for example, by hydropower, and then off it goes. I'll jump into some of our historical issues. Must mention that we're quite new to app dynamics, um, so we're still sort of transi transitioning into this whole new world. Very exciting. No end to end monitoring, only infrastructure. So we would only, um, as you saw yesterday in one of the pres presentations, actually see when CPU memory, that sort of thing, starts failing. Um, we have no application monitoring except for sort of servers up, down type of thing, i.e. IES servers down or Apache servers down. No single source of truth. Multiple people have to, uh, to sort of developed their own applications, so multiple tools, multiple tools used to identify root causes. So the different sort of application teams, ADM teams as we call them, would have developed their own monitoring tools to basically look after the applications that, oh, they also developed. So kind of looking at their own homework, right? And of course, there's always the race against the clock, yeah? Negative impact of historical issues. Mean time to resolution. Well, I think we've heard that one a few times this week. We always have the issue about identifying where the problem sits. We know that a server failed, but we don't actually know what causes it. Or even worse, we get one of the traders phoning us up as in your application doesn't work again. And then of course it starts, oh, uh, must be one or the other. So it took us always a very long time to actually establish where the exact problem is, especially when there is, for example, a multitude of applications within one stack, and we have quite a few of those. Fixing then, of course, depending where it is, also took quite a long time, but yeah, you've got 20 people on one phone call, you can just imagine how that goes, yeah. So your app is slow, or your app is, <clears throat> Must be the database, must be the network, and the network goes, what the hell? Yeah, it's not me. That still happens from time to time. We're not deploying app dynamics throughout the entire stack. We mainly focus on our tier one applications. Uh, so from a CEF1, CEF2 perspective. In other areas, unfortunately, we're still maturing that whole sort of piece where about, guys, it's about the collaboration piece and not just pointing fingers in that sort of direction. Yeah. Our ideal solution. Um, Harlan from Tradeport actually mentioned that uh, earlier this morning in his breakout. It's about the monitoring maturity model. Uh, we also took a good look at that. So you have your sort of chaotic, reactive, proactive service and value. Value, of course, being absolutely fantastic. We were sort of at the um, reactive phase. Um, not good enough. Had to do something about that. We started looking at, can we actually go to the ultimate? And from a return of investment perspective, time and money, we couldn't actually see that that would be a step that we could take immediately. So we decided to go for the service level. Yeah. Service level should be initially good enough, good enough for us, especially around the tier one and tier two application stack. Um, and that's the journey that we're on now. Yeah. Ideal picture. Business transaction monitoring, application topology, visualization, application monitoring, and user experience. We do that for some of the internal applications around Confluence, Jira, SharePoint, 
and of course infrastructure monitoring and database monitoring, bringing it all together into one view so that you can actually easily pinpoint where the problem might be. Research done. What are the must-haves? Well, depending on who you talk to, of course, you get a different answer. Um, infrastructure guys will have a certain view. Application guys will have a certain view. Um, took all of that and actually went through. These are the sort of four or five main components that we want to get addressed by installing an APM solution. What we did then is uh, looking at the market leaders. Um, who is currently Gartner top sort of right-hand quadrant in this? And more importantly, what is their future roadmap? That was quite important to us. This is not a one-year solution. This is not a two-year solution. This is going to be part of a product line for a very, very, very long time. Yeah. So I'm here. So you can guess who sort of won that race. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, App Dynamics, and we're now in that journey. Pilot implementation, this is the fun stuff. So we decided to go for an on-premise solution for one or two reasons. Um, biggest reason was data sort of sensitivity. People who have worked or work with a German company will have heard the word workers' council once or twice, Betriebsrat, who are very, very protective about the data that you store that might contain not necessarily customer data, but employee data. So anything that you might store in your system from which you might be able to derive working habits of certain employees is an absolute no-no. So we had to have a nice conversation with them first, tell them about what we were planning to do, and how we were going to filter this out. First question they asked, of course, are you going to put this in the cloud or on-prem? Well, well, don't even need to ask that question. We'll put it on-prem. Once we cleared Workers' Council, we then also started to look at, of course, we want to do some integration, which was another big part for us. We want to be able to integrate this into our Confluence, our JIRA, our ServiceNow implementation, which we also did this year and potentially some other tools that we're looking at for the future as well, which basically takes me to the, sorry, plugins. Tool replacement is another thing. What can AppDynamics do that we have for currently done maybe at 10, 20% by another tool? Um, and that's where a lot of the custom-built applications, custom-built monitoring applications were basically, we can take them away and actually replace that with AppDynamics. So, Pilot, feedback, great feedback, I must say. Um, I'm an operations guy. I actually took this to the application boys, and they loved it from day one. It was easy for them to use, easy for them to install. They could manage it. They could actually influence what they, were, that what they wanted to see and what they did not want to see, which was fantastic. It also sort of bridged the gap between application and infrastructure. And that's, for me, absolute key to deliver a very successful service to the business. This is where my hotel and catering background come in, you know, service, try to please everybody. I think that is an absolute key in the future of where IT is going to go, bridging that gap between the different IT departments, right? And then, of course, management. How much? Standard sort of question, yeah? Show me the ROI. How much is this going to cost me? What, how, much, how, how quickly can I actually get money back on this? So to sort of address the management issue, we had our um, to-do list. What we did is we looked at the cost of all P1s and P2s for the last 24 months. And that's a big job, depending on how many P1s and P2s you've had. We did not really have any visibility into that. We just migrated from HP Service Center to ServiceNow. We've lost some data. Oh, and remember that Workers' Council? We can't actually do proper reporting within servers now because of certain constraints. So it took us a couple of days to actually get that data. The other part, of course, that we want to show is the duration of the incidents and how App Dynamics might actually help us to reduce the duration of those incidents. Live view, very important. One dashboard or one live view of all your applications so you can actually see what's going on. And, sorry, 
Uh, and the live view, basically, we have now, we basically went into a model straight away where we assigned the different applications into the different tiers and the different groups so that the different domains could actually look at their applications as well. When we started with 3.9, or when we did the initial pilot install with 3.9, that was still a little bit of a problem because you can actually see the mapping back to other applications. Luckily, now in the newer version, even though you've got it specified as one application, you can still the link, see the links back going into other applications, which is quite important for us. Because, of course, our CAO area, the applications that they do have, do have links into the trading component, and vice versa. Yeah? Business benefits, there's a few. Reduction of number of severity ones, that's what we're aiming for. Faster root cause isolation, we've already been able to do that, even in the proof of concept. Um, there was such a demand for this tool by the application guys that even though it was a proof of concept installation, they were like, I don't care, I want to install in my production. I'm willing to take that risk. If that box goes down, Tomorrow, it's going to cost me a lot more than, you know, you can prevent that from happening by actually giving me that visibility, yeah? It sort of cured the throw more tin at it syndrome. Um, one of the sort of first bit of feedback that I had from the application guys is I saw on one of the servers a high CPU utilization at certain times of the day. So, as a good infrastructure guy does, he walks over to the application guy and says, look, I can see there's a problem with the server. I'm happy to give you a bit more CPU and a bit more RAM. Turn around straight away and said, no, that tool that we installed yesterday actually identified that it's a problem with the application. So don't give me more tin. I'll fix the application tomorrow. And I'm like, OK, I'm happy with that. Resolve performance issues before production. In certain applications that we have, either built in-house or third party, there were specific performance issues that we could not pinpoint to a certain .NET component or a certain Java component. We have quite a lot of Java and .NET in our house. With this tool, we're actually able to pick that up before it hit our production environment. So in a pre-prod, we install, we've got AppDynamics installed on all of our P1s, P2 in pre-prod, and it actually started to pick up issues before it hits our production issue, which is great. Changes in incident management. Well, the one sort of view where your support team can go to kind of explains that already. You know straight away which team to call. It used to be help desk picks up the call, throws it at the first available team, applications, and then see where it lands, right? With the dashboards that we know now and the live views that we know now, we can straight away see where it is red or amber, whether it's the database, the infrastructure, web, whatever. It actually has improved the response time of the teams within the incident management process. And more importantly, created a better awareness within the incident management person. So the incident manager has now straight away a much better view how to coordinate the team, what to attack first, where to go first. Changes in problem management. Yeah, it helped a little bit. We're still tuning that a little bit, how we can make that better. Uh, being able to go back in time uh, using the dashboards definitely helps with that to actually understand when the problem occurred, whether it has occurred before. So you can kind of start anticipating is it going to be a recurring problem or is it something of the past. Um, the other thing with that, of course, is using, being able to go back in time. Um, you're able to then address it to the right teams as well, right? More detailed problem description. You can drill into the problems that you've identified in AppDynamics and actually see it down to whatever the query database, all those sort of statements. You can pull it up there and then. The learnings. Don't try to fix it all. Pick your battles carefully. I, um, when we started this journey, I should have listened a little bit better to um, my dear account manager who said, no, 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 you don't want to attack 12 different applications in one go. Pick one or two and start with that. Apply focus there. Um, I'm like, yeah, right. Why would I make two people happy if I can make 12 people happy, right? Start with a small target area. It actually allows you to grow the champions or the evangelists a lot better. Um, after 
realizing that doing it on 12 applications in one go, we started focusing on our CIO area. And we found two or three people in that team who just took this on and really drove it forward, also across to the other areas, so into the trading and into the back office area. Really helpful to get those guys on board. Identify an area also where everybody sees a positive impact. So your service management team, your infrastructure guys, your application, but also your management. Yeah? If there is an area where you have frequent problems and management constantly keeps on asking, how's this application, how's that application doing? Give them the dashboard, give them access to the dashboard. Yeah, we don't see this very often this week. It doesn't work everywhere. Third party applications support might be limited there. We do a lot with OpenLink, Endure. We do a lot with Tipco, Multicast, Nexus, Mirrorware, and some other third party tools that are, in certain cases, black box solutions. Um, AppDynamics doesn't work everywhere. It has addressed 60 to 70% of our estate, which is 60 to 70% that we didn't have before. So we're quite happy, we're very happy with the result, put it that way. But you need to be sort of conscious about that. It's not going to be that sort of magic wand that you can wave and you have visibility across all your applications. Another important one is applications that do not run on boot. Now, let me explain that for a second. Some of our applications are triggered by actions of other applications. So we have .NET components that basically call upon another .NET component at certain times, whatever time. Um, randomly or generated by a transaction or an action of the other applications and then the executable.NET component starts up which caused an overhead on startup time. The application no longer started up in one or two seconds, it actually took longer because of at the time that the .NET component calls the other component, the agent tries to wrap itself around it and actually delayed the startup of that application. So we have to find a way around that. We disabled the discovery bit uh, in the startup, which has improved the startup time, but more importantly, also talk to the application guys as to why this might not work. Yeah? Getting them to understand it and not say, well, AppDynamics doesn't work, it makes my application three times slower. Getting them to understand why it does it is very important. And custom code that is not Java.net might not give you the result that you want. Uh, we do. Define, we, we have defined custom entry points and custom exit points, so we do actually get the visibility, for example, going into our TIPCO bus. We see it all go in, but we can't actually see it come out again. Same a little bit in our Endure environment. See it go in, not necessarily come out. Once we start actually looking at potentially proper transaction analytics, it might be slightly different, but that's for the future. Find champions. Get people involved that have good connection with other application owners so that they go out and talk to other teams. It's very important. Get service management involved. They're going to be the ones that can actually start using this tool to run their sort of weekly reports, their dashboards, if management still wants a weekly report because they can just log on and see this real time, right? Another important one, start thinking about your end service owner. We deal with strategic partners. Um, the operations team is 80% outsourced. You need to start thinking about, is your strategic service provider actually able to support this tool? There are not many strategic partners out there that can actually support this tool successfully. Another important thing is, wherever you're going to place this, make sure that the people that are going to own this are actually understanding what the business is trying to do. Which in certain cases, if you've outsourced your operations offshore, these guys are just there to switch on, reboot a server, build a server, whatever. They don't necessarily understand the business processes that they are supporting. I find that very important for a successful AppDynamics implementation. Yeah? Find the right group that's going to own this tool. I know stories about people having created dedicated teams around this. So you might actually end up with a new team to support your AppDynamics installation. also use the AppDynamics experience and expertise. There's a reason why they've grown this quickly over the last few years. 
They know, they have the experience from other companies, big and small, across many different sort of industries. So in many cases, they will have seen the problem before and can actually help you with that. What's next for us? Well, this might change a little bit. We do want to have some integration with Nagios, even though after seeing the demo um, earlier this week, we might want to reconsider that a little bit. Makes sense, right? Integration with Greylog. We use Greylog uh, now as well in our organization. Um, we do want to build some integration into that so we can still get that iDevi deep links or via dashboards so we can bring it all back together. We just want to start using AppDynamics to actually validate change activity in the future as well through ServiceNow and use AppDynamics for cloud migration. We currently have most of our infrastructure on-prem. We have started the journey into the Amazon cloud slowly. And of course, AppDynamics will actually help us to do the baseline of our key applications now to match that performance with whatever we're going to put in the cloud or even hopefully improve what it's doing in the cloud. Some of the takeaways. Engage all areas early on, application, infrastructure, and service management. Engage with your peers. Talk to other companies. Um, the guys in the UK set up a meeting with other potential customers and put them all in one room and say, guys, you're all trialing this product. Share your experience and share your problems. We very quickly moved on from a technology-focused conversation to a people and process focused conversation. The technology here is not the issue. It's all around how it's going to change your process, all around how you're actually going to enable your people around this. So having those conversations with like-minded people in one room without having to worry about NDAs and disclosing company secrets is, is very, very valuable. If at first you don't succeed, try and try again. Don't give up on that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's, it's, if you can't get the people involved, it's both from a technology and a people perspective. If you can't get the right people, or certain people involved straight away, find somebody else and then show what you've done. Go back to them after a while. I think that's very important. Also, from a technology perspective, if you can't get it to work out of the box, use AppDynamics. Uh, the guys have spent quite a lot of time on site in our office in Germany trying to figure out how they could actually get tip code to work and they've managed to do that up to a certain level. So it's been very, very good to actually do that. Not just giving up, actually trying it to deliver this. And as I said earlier on, start thinking about future owners sooner rather than later. Um, nothing is worse than installing this product and letting go into production and then say, OK, guys, who's going to manage this on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, at that point, nobody will start using it anymore. You have to start thinking about this very, very early on. That's it from my perspective. Questions. And considering there are not many people, I hope I'm going to get some questions. Go ahead. Correct. Very, very good question. You know open link then, I assume. Did everybody get that question? So, OK, so it was around uh, our NJOR environment, the open link environment I was talking about. There is uh, not a lot of visibility in there. And the question was around how do we actually integrate the tool stack into this. We've plugged, open, uh, we've plugged AppDynamics into the database. So we actually monitor the Oracle database that sits behind this. We also use a lot of .NET components actually feeding into that open link area. Where we don't have visibility, and you're absolutely right, is in the open link tool stack. That is a black box. The interesting part is that we're actually doing, on top of all of this, we're also doing a migration from our V8 and your environment to a V12 and your environment, which is a big, big step for us to take. And we ended up talking to open link about this. And their jaw dropped to the floor. They were impressed with this tool. And they were like, this is something that we want. Their visibility 
into this sort of APM world is not going to happen until version 14. And even post version 14, we're talking about 2017 before they actually start delivering their own tool stack around this. So they know there's a lot of stuff out there. They know that people want to get sight into what's happening in their world with other APM tools. But OpenLink does what OpenLink does. They'll build their own tool and sell that to you at an absolute massive premium. Right? Anybody else? Tricky question. Um, we have 21 applications on our controller at the moment. And the guy that manage, is managing it at the moment is me. I gave up my sort of God rights two years ago um, and basically delegated all that sort of stuff to my team, which is fantastic. But this is something that I took on. I, I believe in this tool. Um, I have other guys that can actually support me from an OS perspective. I have some of the uh, sort of evangelists, the, the champions, helping me from an application perspective. So the controller itself, at the moment, I look after with a little bit of support. I couldn't give it to my strategic partner because they don't know how to do this yet. But the application guys themselves, the application support guys, they actually manage their own agents for now because it's all in dev test. We haven't properly gone into the production controller yet. Uh, so they can manage their own uh, .NET agents, their config files, and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, at the moment, it's me driving it, which I've been doing now for, I think it's four or five, yeah, four or five months. That aspect doesn't, pardon? More than one controller. One controller. Just one for now. So the future plan is actually to create a separation between dev and uh, non-prod and prod, let's call it that. And at that point, I do go hands off. Like we need, that's what I mean. We need to find an owner for this, not just for managing the agents, but also for managing the controller. From an OS perspective, of course, I can get the support from my strategic partner. Uh, from the app dynamics perspective itself. But then, again, looking back at the announcement, that should become a lot easier in the future as well, right? So. What did we actually deploy at the moment? At the moment, we've done .NET agents, Java agents, database agent, and end user monitoring. We haven't built the extensions yet um, because we are now at that point that we know what this can do. And we've made the decision to step away from a um, three-letter company that has a four-letter product that does our infrastructure monitoring and move that to uh, Nagios. But as I said earlier, based on what we've seen this week, we might sort of consider to create a split there and put the infrastructure piece. So are you doing machine agents at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so machine agents, we do have that as well. Absolutely right. Um, I've been lucky enough to uh, trial the uh, the beta version of the actual infrastructure component. Um, and I was impressed at that point already. So yes, we do have machine agents as well. Very good point. So within the dashboard, you can actually see when an application state has changed and the different transaction point has occurred within the application. What we want to do is actually see if any existing changes for that, from an application perspective, have also been registered in servers now. Let me give, the, let me give you an example in our world. Our embedded guys, let's call that the sort of mini DevOps world, uh, they are basically developers that sit on the trading floor next to the traders and have full admin access to the production environment and basically create new applications or changes to applications whenever a trader shouts, I want to be able to do this, and I want to be able to do this five minutes ago. So these guys then start building whatever they think is best for it, upload that to the production service, sometimes even develop it on the production service, and bring it into life. And we have no visibility on this. So we need to tweak out the finer details on this. But you can see when certain instances have changed of the application stack. 
And that's what we want to start logging. And that's what we want to then reference back into the change management process that we have in ServiceNow. Um, proper pilot was three months. Uh, the entire team, let me have a count there. So we had about five, six, six people in the UK and another eight in uh, Germany. As I said, we're only like a 350 people IT organization, so we're not that big. But it was across the entire stack. So we have people out of different areas playing part in this journey. Uh, including application guys, infrastructure guys, uh, DBAs. Some of the best responses actually came from the DBAs around this tool, which is absolutely impressive. And of course, then also integration with uh, service management, literally to see, look guys, at one point, can we maybe start reporting on business transactions and not just on percentage up, percentage down? And you get this puzzled look on people's faces and they're like, what are you talking about? business transactions. But yeah, that's, that's a learning process that we're going through. But we try to address at least one or two individuals out of the different teams that we have. Yeah. Okay, um, just to repeat. Um, Question was around, we've done the analysis around the 12 to 24 months around the CEF1 and CEF2 incidents. Um, are we now able to actually start forecasting around our potential future CEF1, CEF2s when we deploy and when, whilst we're deploying this tool as well? I'll be honest, no. Because of the amount of change that we're going through with these applications. AppDynamics is gonna go on the applications where, it, where there is the highest volume of change. In the trading applications, in the CAO applications, we see a lot of change. So every single month, there will be application changes. So based on that, forecasting what it might turn into is very, very difficult. It's crystal ball work. I don't want to make promises to my management that we can't deliver, yeah? I'd rather, pardon? How did I get the money? How did I get the money? Ooh, I wish that question didn't come up. I cheated. As I said, I promised management that I can take away this product from a three-letter company, um, which basically the licenses for those were coming up for renewal next year, and that's how I got the money. Plus, and this is a good reminder, thank you for that, earlier in the presentation, uh, actually it was yesterday, uh, it was also said that a lot of companies don't actually put budgets, uh, put budgets in their plan for APM. Last year, I actually decided I had enough of how infrastructure monitoring is done and asked for a decent amount of budget to actually implement APM after I explained what APM was about. And management straight away approved it. They could see the value. They could see the points around, okay, we still get too many phone calls from people saying that the application is not working. Yeah, go for it. So that helps a lot. So the two combined, the budget set aside for it this year, which I need to spend in the next two weeks. Um, and of course, not renewing that other product is sort of sealed the deal for management. Right behind you. No, so very good question. Again, um, it, it goes back to what we were talking about, not having visibility into all of the components. Uh, where there are actually application stacks where we did get the entire transaction view, right? That was the question. We do. So there are certain applications that not necessarily use the open link tool stack. And for those, we have full end-to-end -end visibility. And this is the first time that we were actually able to achieve this. This is mainly in the CAO, the, the, the asset optimization, commercial asset optimization area where we'd be able to see the transactions or the requests come in and follow it all the way through. Luckily enough, those guys are actually using web-based frontends into a .NET and then into either a SQL or an Oracle database, but we were able to track those applications end-to-end. -end. One of the other areas where we were able to do this, um, 
we do a lot of sort of weather analysis, weather forecasting, because if you cold winter is coming up, people are going to be burning more energy. So every single day, we pull down literally terabytes of data on weather maps to see where it might rain or where it might be cold or all these sort of things. We created full end-to-end -end visibility in that area as well to actually see where there was a delay. Because very often we get a call as in, hey, your infrastructure is not working. Well, actually, no, it's the link coming in that's being slowed down. It's not the actual component in the middle, right? So yes, we have been able to, I can't actually show you the applications for obvious reasons, but yeah, we have been able to successfully do that uh, in at least half of the tools, half of the application stack that we've, in, uh, that we've put this on. Yeah. Matt. Um, I, okay, let me, let me be completely honest about that. Uh, the main reason for that is that I can actually still continue to give that full visibility in one browser. So if an application guy sees an issue, at the moment it stops, okay, there's an issue with the machine, but they can't actually see the underlying processes on these machines. Now, with this new agent, they can. So they can fully, not necessarily manage the entire problem, but identify the entire problem themselves. From a Nagios perspective, it doesn't give you technically a lot more, I'll be honest, but it does give you that one view without actually having to worry about cobbling it all together. Because as soon as you start cobbling things together, things start falling apart, as we all know. So being able to use one product to give that true end-to-end -end visibility down to Windows servers, file level, whatever, great. I'll take that, as long as it comes free, and that's your job. Goodness me. Um, so, what, from a financial perspective, from a... Yeah, good question. Um, so, my strategy, as I said earlier, AppDynamics is not going to be applied across the board. So, it really depends on what sort of cost you're looking at. So, can I still use the AppDynamics infrastructure monitoring piece? to fill a gap that another product can do very, very cheaply, where the skill set is available, easy to find, or actually use a tool where the skill set is, well, growing from, I guess, last Monday. So for the next 12 to 18 months, I will continue for the non-app dynamics area with my Nagios. Even with the app dynamics area, I will probably still install the Nagios agent because the overhead is not worth worrying about. But then in 12 to 18 months' time, once I see a little bit of that maturity, we might change our course of action, right? Most important thing is not just the cost of the product, but also where can I find the support? I don't want to go out and hire people for this. Like I said, we've outsourced most of our operations, and I'd like to continue to do so. Yeah. Anybody else? It was actually the business who said, I don't care, it's a proof of concept environment, I need that installed now. So, yes, it's there, absolutely. Uh, the guy who actually requested this has this dashboard now on his screen. Out of his 24 screens that he's got on his desk, one of them is that nice little, hopefully green, dashboard that he looks at every single day. So, yeah. How significant was that for getting done what you um, Very. That area that I'm talking about specifically, if he has half an hour downtime, in his words, he would lose 5 million euros. I would challenge the lose. If you don't have it, you can't lose it. You've missed an opportunity, yes, but hey, I'm not going to have that discussion with him. I'm happy for him to take it and put it on his board, right? So yeah, but it's, it's a good question. It's giving that visibility to the business, uh, especially sort of tech-savvy business, because that's actually what we're dealing with in the trading area. They are quite tech-savvy. A lot of these guys actually developed the applications in the trading world when it started back in 99. So they know what they're talking about. 
And it's always sort of the infrastructure guys that get the kicking first, right? So, yeah, very good. John? What about analytics? Yes. But again, we have to be quite careful with this because of the Works Council part as well. Um, analytics would make sense for us as long as we get that better sort of visibility within the NGO world. But we have to be careful with the sort of data. The last thing that we want to do is expose our market position to a third party tool. That's a concern in Germany. Germany and their privacy and data rights are yeah, challenging, I think is the best word to put for that. Yeah. But yeah, it's something, again, it comes down to proof of value. And that's where I probably end up looking towards App Dynamics. Okay, come in, tell us what is the proof of value here, definitely. So to that point, do you think your, does your line of business owners know their analytics use cases, or do you expect to coach them? We have an entire department called Structure and Anal Analytics. Um, Lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> From a business perspective. Yeah, um, they're the most difficult customers, as you can probably imagine. They're not, they're not easy. It's, uh, it's, um, if we can explain it to them what the value is um, and actually start using this properly and get them sort of step away from Excel a little bit because that's the world that traders live in, then yes, but that's, I'll be honest, me and a small team have been driving this. And I'd like to take this one step at a time and actually deliver one component very, very successful before actually taking that big jump into something that, even from my IT operations background, goes over my head. The man in the back is wiggling his fingers. I guess that means um, wrap up, right? <laughs> we didn't discuss sign language beforehand, but... Cool. Last one? Great. Thank you guys for joining me.